really happy that we were able to get this conference off the ground and get it kick started. Uh, like Prasha mentioned, um, I'm one of the founders of the Women of Color in STEAM initiative, and I'm also here in Canada. And I today I'll be talking about looking at alternative career paths outside of academia after your PhD. But of course, if you're in your graduate um, career doing a master's or some other degree, this can also work for you as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about my journey thus far. Um, yeah, this is me here, and this is me soon, crossing my fingers. Um, so like many of us know, if especially if you're in a PhD journey, it's a huge convoluted mess. And we start out one, you know, we start out, for example, on one end, and we're thinking, okay, it's going to be the smooth, linear transition into me getting my PhD degree, and then becoming a doctor and using that for possibly becoming a professor later on. At least that's what some of us think. But during that time and within this whole journey, it becomes a huge mess. At least for me, it did. And I don't think anyone that I know had a completely smooth and linear path to where they currently are after having obtained the PhD degree. So what I want to make really aware here of is that within this time, during one of those times of messes, I have managed to get an internship at a pharma company. And then a little bit after that, I managed to start doing some nonprofit consulting. And all the while, so I have this completely covered throughout the beginning to the what will be the end of my PhD as science communication, because that's something I feel that we all do, uh, whether or not you realize you're doing it, whether it's in the oral form uh, through speaking engagements and outreach or through the written form. So for example, you're writing for a magazine at your university or you've been fortunate enough to get um, amazing opportunities. So just like one of our keynote speakers this morning, Melissa, who is currently writing for Forbes. So these are a few things that I've managed to do during my time in the PhD. And just like a few of our other speakers, so for example, um, Bhairavi, who spoke earlier, and, um, and Christine, who just spoke, are both entrepreneurs. And one of the reasons why I'm even giving this talk, uh, as we know, coming in, coming in to do a PhD not all of us actually want to finish and become a professor. Some of us actually just want the degree to continue on to do something else. Uh, but for most of us, we probably came in thinking, you know what, I may stay in academia, or we, some of us came in not having any idea of what we would even want to do after and not thinking about it. But somewhere within my journey, by my third year, I started getting extremely anxious, extremely... Um, sad and depressed and then feeling very low on motivation and productivity and that's something I really want to touch on today in my talk and that's because I think it's something that we do talk about but we don't normally go over this and, and talk about it that much if we're giving a talk for example so for today for example and so that actually was the driving force for me to find out what it is that I can actually do afterwards with my degree having that sense of fear of the unknown, what's going to happen in the future, what can I possibly do with this degree, because I know for sure that I don't want to continue in an academia. And so uh, after having those very low feelings and feeling very unproductive and, and, and demotivated, I started to chat and, and talk to other people around me and I started with postdocs, actually. And I started talking to postdocs to find out from them, you know, what is it that they wanted to do? Why are they doing a postdoc? And what are they hoping to do after? Quite a few of them, to my surprise, did want to continue on, but because of the frustration of the lack of jobs that are currently available for people with PhDs in terms of getting professorship, many of them were just looking and hoping to seek employment outside of academia. And that's where my conversation started. From there, I started talking to other people. I started looking into university groups on campus. So that's you know, starting close to home is what was really helpful and beneficial for me because I had no idea where to go, what to do, who to start talking to. And by looking into that, what I realized is there were actually quite a 
a few resources on my campus I wasn't aware of otherwise when I had started my PhD. Some being university resources. So for example, your university career center or you know, um, perhaps resume writing or actually student groups. So student groups uh, that advocate for life science development of PhDs or also consulting. And so that's where the nonprofit consulting bit comes in. And the internship at a pharma company comes in a little bit after that. So first, I'll talk about my experience in the pharmaceutical industry. So here, I've just got a bunch of points. Um, I'll just leave this up as I talk about it. But for my whole experience, I, I was actually quite fortunate. And that's because not many people in our situation. So when I say ours, I mean, if you're doing, especially if you're doing basic lab science and you're at the bench, you don't normally have the opportunity to, for example, take a year off and go do a full-time internship. That's usually unheard of. So from my experience, I was fortunate in that there was a particular scholarship that I applied for. And by the way, my supervisor told me to apply for it. So that made it even easier for me. I applied for it and I got it. Now for the second year after I applied for it, one of the stipulations was that I did an internship outside of academia. That was a godsend. It was a dream come true. And I know that doesn't normally happen. That's probably not the case for many people. However, I'll talk a little bit more later about ways in which you can probably try to get opportunities, although that although you're stuck 24-7 in the lab without having permission to leave to do something full-time for a year. So after having gotten the after having gotten the scholarship for the second time, I went to my supervisor my supervisor and I told him, well, you know, I did get the scholarship for the second time, which means that I do need to get an industry uh, internship. Now, they didn't stipulate how long I needed the internship for. It ranged from, I could get one for like probably a month to as long as, uh, to as long as necessary. However, when I was looking, I didn't find anything that was a few weeks to a couple months. The only internships that I found at the time were a year long. And so that was a bit of contention for my supervisor because of course he didn't want me to leave the lab for that long. However, because I did take the scholarship, I did win the scholarship. And of course we all know that funding is a huge deal, especially here in Canada, we are paid from our supervisor's uh, grants. And so if you're not getting funding from outside it's sources, 12 so for example, from scholarships, they're the ones who are paying your stipend. So that in itself was good enough for him to say, okay, you know what, uh, go ahead and do this. He was very apprehensive about it, but um, nevertheless, I did it. The way in which I actually got the um, internship, though, which is another important point that I really want to make for people, is, and I think this was touched on by quite a few of our previous speakers, so I think um, Bayaravi and Parshidi, who spoke this morning, alluded to this, and then Christine also talked about this. Huge, I cannot stress how huge it is to network. Networking is exceptionally important and is one of the reasons why I was able to get this internship in the first place. It was also interesting how I even met the person who, through which I networked to get this internship. And so once again, it's from doing all these side things and, and being involved in side things is actually what led me to this person in the first place, which I think was one of the questions earlier as to, you know, whether you want to take a course or start up a nonprofit or start up a business and be an entrepreneur. Should you do it? I always will 110% say yes. There's absolutely everything to gain from it. Of course, you have to know how much you can handle, but you should always do it. So a few colleagues and myself had actually started up a, an organization on campus. My research is in diabetes. And so we started up research uh, and uh, a student group in diabetes where we started to give workshops about opportunities in industry outside of academia, one of the speakers that came in actually happened to be this person that worked at this pharma company, who I then asked, who I actually then told that I was looking for an internship opportunity, who then told me that actually, ah, oh, his company hires interns. And usually they hire interns from 
business, so business schools or bio, uh, specific biotech program, but they've never had a PhD intern and it would be brand new for them. And it didn't really matter because once I heard that, I was just like, you know what, I'm going to go for it. Sent my resume through, uh, through the whole process. I had him as a reference and a contact and within a few months I was hired. So that whole experience in itself really brought home to me how important it was to network, how, how it really validated to me the value of my extracurricular activities. And then here it was, I was starting brand new and fresh, my first time having a job outside of academia. I had worked many times, but that was, you know, doing, being a lab assistant, being a TA, that's all within academia. This was my first experience outside. And the position that I got was called a medical information associate. And so it was very different from being in the lab because I was no longer in the lab. If you're someone who's looking for an internship that is a scientist-related role, in Canada in particular, it's very difficult to get that. A lot of the companies here that also are in the state they have more scientist positions and scientist roles in the States, but within Canada, they're more, uh, they're either more client facing roles and they're more business related. So within this particular role, I was completely not at the bench anymore. I was now working a lot in teams and working of course by myself. There was lots of literature review and writing. So that of course was a huge bonus for me because we you know we all have a lot of that experience doing a PhD. Uh, the main difference though was there was no interpretation in my role. So for example, normally within our PhD programs, when we read a paper, we are critical, we're taught to be critical, look at all the data really well, we look at who the authors are, what journal it was published in. Of course, we really look over the data and how the data, um, and, and try to figure out as best as possible how the data was analyzed, and then we make our own interpretation. This role was a little bit different in terms of it was more looking at what data is already presented, um, what is already out there. We gather it all up, we write it up in the form of a letter, and then we then are asked to send this out to anyone who has questions on a specific drug. So I was in the oncology department, so I was put, I was responsible for specific drugs within that area. And then I was asked to make these letters in anticipation of doctors, pharmacists, nurses, and sometimes family members contacting the company in order to get this information about the drug. So information can be anything between uh, how does this drug interact with another drug? What are the side effects of the drug? Um, can you can you chew this tablet, split this tablet? Must you take this tablet whole? So things like things of that nature. So that was a little bit of a difference for me because I was not allowed to interpret any of the data. And another huge part of it, which I probably had more of it within this space than within my academic setting, although I have done collaborations, but the collaborations within this company were very broad. So people are expected to collaborate very broadly within different departments, within your own department, within different divisions of your own department. And so that, those were some really huge, huge bits. And so, like I mentioned, I was hired. So I went through the hiring process. Um, it was something really, it was really good for me to know so that when I'm ready to apply to my, to, to the next job, I'll have an idea of how that goes, at least within the pharmaceutical setting. It was a paid year long internship. So this was also my very first paid uh, job that paid, of course, far more than my stipend. So I was very happy with that. I think we all would be. Um, and so then What's a great, of course, a great um, benefit of this is that you now have the possibility of being hired full time. So this is the time you would put your best foot forward, do as much work as possible, network as much as you can within the company. And when your time is up, if there is enough money, of course, within the company and they're hiring, they would now more look to you to hire you than to want to have a fresh person come in. Of course, another opportunity is you're able to find out about roles within the company. So I can't tell you how much I really, really utilize my time in this company. I networked like crazy. I spoke to everyone who would listen to me. 
I was shameless. And this was the first time I think I was so really out there because I guess I felt I was really hungry. I was hungry to know what all the roles were about, what people's, um, what people thought about the company, you know, why were they, if they were there so long, why were they there? So that, that was a great sign. That meant they loved the company, they loved their environment. And that was another great experience for me um, to have was to understand not only, you know, is it the type of work that I'm doing, but you really have got to be extremely comfortable and happy within the environment that you're working. And another huge thing, it's process of elimination. It was great. I was in this position. So now that I've had a year of experience in this position, do I like this? Can I see myself in this role? Or maybe not. Maybe I don't like this. Maybe this is not what I want to do. And that's actually good for me to know. So now I know coming out of my PhD whether or not I want to do this. So for the record, I was actually fortunate enough to be able to work here for a longer period of time. However, I said, you know what, I need to go back and finish my degree. Otherwise, I probably will never finish my degree. And I will always just stay at this company. So that was, uh, that was my experience for a year at the pharmaceutical company. After leaving the pharma company and back in, I wanted to, I wanted to know more. Um, I think that's part of my personality that really lends to me being a scientist is that I absolutely love researching everything and anything that I'm interested in, of course. So the other thing was consulting. So this was the second thing that I've heard other PhDs looking into post-graduation. First it was, oh, I heard people talking about pharma. Let's check this out. What is this? And I was fortunate to get the internship. And the second thing was consulting. So what was one of the first things they did? I checked up on campus again, and I found out that we had student and alumni groups uh, that were there for, that were specifically there to have students work as consultants, um, for uh, pro bono cons consultants for nonprofits. So I applied to, I think, three of them and was fortunate enough to get an interview for one, and then went through that process. Now, this process was very, very different, of course, compared to the pharma experience number one the pharma experience was in an actual company whereas these were from student and alumni groups so that's one difference but number two the types of interviews so the interview for a pharma company where they would ask you behavioral type questions and get to understand your fit within a company these are all terms and words that i learned and i and um i now use and if you have any questions about this later i'd be more than happy to go over them with you but within this interview process, their, their interview process for consultants are case studies. So, for example, they'll give you a case and you will then be asked questions based on this case. It's, it's very similar in terms of problem solving to a PhD. And I can see that's why many PhDs gravitate towards being consultants. So after having gone through the whole process, I was first on a team um, doing amazing. So I must say, I, I did fall in love with it because we were doing, I in particular love the fact that we were doing work for nonprofits. So I have a deep passion and affection for nonprofits. If I could, I would probably start every nonprofit known to humankind. Um, but we were there trying to tackle a business question for a nonprofit and I was part of a team and this is what I had to get used to. You just always worked in a team environment. But I have to say, I really enjoyed it. And that's because I worked with a phenomenal group of people. And that's one thing you have to know. These, so for this, for consulting and then for pharma, you have to really take stock of who you are as a person. And that's something I believe that was mentioned earlier is you need to sit and really write out the, the types of things that are important to you. What are your priorities? Where do you see yourself? What are the types of skills you want to use or you want to learn? And so if you know that you're not great at teamwork or you don't want to be involved in teamwork, I would tell you immediately consulting is not for you because everything you do is pretty much within a team. Um, so like I said, there was lots of teamwork involved, we had a business question. Uh, our nonprofit was trying to grow their profits by 5% within, or 20%, I believe, within five years. And so from there, took in a lot of, in terms for a PhD, a lot of data analysis, a lot of uh, problem solving, a lot of critical thinking, a lot of research. All of those aspects of your PhD went into this type of project. Um, of course, here, there was client interaction, but 
from a consultant point of view, if you're an associate consultant, meaning you're at an entry level, you will not be having much cli uh, client interaction. That would be more for the lead of your team, who tends to be the liaison between the client and your company, whatever company, you say, for example, you're consulting for. Like I mentioned, problem solving. And of course, a huge thing, the final product of whatever you've come up with, whatever your solution is for your client, you have to do presentations. And so that's another one of the huge um, skill sets that you take from your PhD. And so one of the amazing outcomes for this, for me, for, from this experience, was that I made a huge network with consultants. And once again, networking comes up. So what was interesting, I'll actually pause to tell you a short story here, was when I was super, super active in the consulting circle, I made it to as many um, consulting networking, networking events as possible. Um, and I had done all this work already. And just for the hell of it, I applied to a few consulting programs. And I got interviews for all of them. Fast forward a year later, I still have all this amazing experience and work that I did actually tacked on to that. I was brought back as a lead as a lead consultant for another case, which is actually one more experience than I had before and an even better one because now I was the lead. However, I was not actively involved in the consulting circles. I hadn't been to networking events and I haven't, I wasn't showing my face as much or being in touch and being in, in communication as much. And very interestingly, just for the hell of it, suppose, supposedly the scientific side of my mind, I said, why not? maybe I should apply for these same positions again. I applied for them and I actually did not get the same response I got the previous time. And so that's a bit of information I think is very important for people to know is that you really need to constantly be relevant and up to date and keep in communication with your circles. So here are a few examples of the transferable skills I would say you have from a PhD or graduate program that a lot of people don't realize as soon as they think about, okay, having to apply for a job that's outside of academia, they start to get worried, they start to get really anxious. You know, you start to doubt yourself and, and you try to figure, you know, what is it that I can actually bring to any type of job outside of academia? All I know to do is to be at a, a wet lab bench or perhaps you're at a dry lab bench and maybe you just have data analysts, uh, analysis skills. But no, we actually have way more than that. We tend to undervalue ourselves and we tend not to be able to really identify what our transferable skills are and the skills that we can actually take and use to benefit the business that we're applying to or perhaps to ourselves if we want to become entrepreneurs. So one of the first huge things is teamwork. Teamwork, teamwork, teamwork. There's so many aspects to so many jobs outside of academia that requires teamwork and people really need to know that you can work with others within the team setting and environment. If not, that will be a huge issue for you. Data analysis, of course, that's self-explanatory. So a lot of us have either managed large data sets or complicated data and had to interpret it. And based on that interpretation, we drive our projects forward, learning about hi our hypothesis. And so this is actually very important for many, many data-driven jobs that you can find outside of academia. Project management. Many of us have also managed multiple projects. So I myself have managed several projects and I'm sure many of you here today have managed several projects yourself. You really need to learn how to upsell that aspect of your skills is that you're able to not only manage the projects, but manage the people, manage the people you work with, manage the relationships you have, that you're able to liaise between not only colleagues and people perhaps under you, but then also people who are senior to you. Adapting and learning quickly are essential skills that we particularly in PhD programs have, and we really need to market that and showcase that because having coming out of this environment, and for example, they wanting to go into a finance related environment people need to know that okay perhaps you did not have this particular experience coming in but you can definitely when the time is needed get down to it learn and adapt very quickly to your new environment and just hit the ground running and of course communication skills so oral and written communication skills for both of the experiences I've had and both of the roles I've been in I've had to do quite a bit of writing. So in the pharma role, I've done quite a bit of writing. And then in the consulting role, there was quite a bit of speaking. 
And there was, of course, speaking in the farmer rule and writing in, in the consulting rule, maybe not as much as the other skills, but both of them extremely important. And that, of course, you have to upsell because not everyone can, can write and speak very well. And they're always looking for those skills in any job. So here are just a list of some non-academic jobs for PhDs or graduate students um, within industry. So when I say industry, I'm talking about biotech, pharma, or consulting. Uh, scientists, for example. So scientists, you can have scientist positions in biotech and pharma companies, science communication. So within the pharma company I was with, I was actually uh, surprised to know that there was a science communication brand or arm of the pharma company, there are also science communication um, agencies that are separate who, where they do medical writing. There's medical science liaison. Um, I know that's really popular in Canada right now for PhDs, and that's because there are a lot of skills that are needed for this position that we actually have and we enjoy doing. So when it comes to keeping up to date with scientific literature, having discussions and debates about it, uh, critiquing and analyzing the papers, doing presentations, and then communicating with expertise in the field, as well as going to conferences, all of that we do in a PhD, and that's what MSLs do as well. And then the consulting that I mentioned earlier. Within the education branch, of course, you can be a lecturer, or you can teach at, at a high school or, or secondary school, um, or, or, um, or, what was the other, the, the, uh, the smaller schools. And then you also have um, admin related um, type of positions. And in government, once again, scientists, there are policy makers, there are also um, grant writers, there's nonprofit sector, where also we need more uh, grant writers. And then also entrepreneurship, like was mentioned earlier by Christine. So there's two photon and by Ravi, who's also an entrepreneur. And then I wanted to just show you guys a few resources for jobs or internships that people may or may not have thought about. So I would start off close to home, like I mentioned. So number one would be university. Look at your career centers and look at your writing centers. Your career centers hopefully are equipped to, to give you enough resources and support that you need. If not, that's fine. There are other places to find it. And like I mentioned, student groups. So we at U of T, so University of Toronto have this student group that's called Life Science Career Development Society. It does a lot of amazing things. It holds workshops. It brings in uh, people or alumni who are currently working outside of academia to give talks. And so they do a lot of amazing work. Government. So I know in the U.S. there's the NIH. There are other government agencies as well that you can possibly get internships with. And in Canada, you can also work for our federal provincial government. And MyTax, which was mentioned earlier. So MyTax is an organization which has a lot of resources and funding, especially for um, research. So for example, doing exchange of research positions. So someone from Toronto can go to possibly Brazil and someone from Brazil can come here. We have those types of relationships. MyTax is also an organization that's filled with resources to help you get started post-academia. So for example, they have uh, workshops on resumes and cover letters and public speaking and project management. So I would make use of that because they're free for students who are still, or people who are students that are still in school. The nonprofit sector. So here I wanted to show you. So you can work for uh, like your cancer societies, your brain societies, diabetes societies. Of course, I had to put diabetes in there. And the nonprofit sector. So if you look here at this Indeed, whoops, this Indeed, um, so this is Indeed.ca, which of course is a job hunting site, which I recommend because I use it. It's the Ontario Brain Institute. They actually have, at least they still, I think they still have a posting up for an internship position. And so that is something that you would, I would recommend students looking for. The Medical Affairs Associate intern position, which is at the bottom here, that's for when you look externally. So when I say externally, that's when you're actually going to start using your network. Once again, a network comes into play. Trust me, you really need one. And seeking opportunities for, from companies. So when I say take initiative, I mean, okay, for example, these postings I have here are present. But what if you didn't see a posting present? I actually had a conversation with a colleague who who told me that she was interested in working part-time 
for a pharma company if they would have her. And what she did is she actually reached out to them here on LinkedIn. So that's something I don't have on my slide. But LinkedIn is another absolutely amazing tool. So she reached out on LinkedIn, sent a message and let them know, you know, and said, hey, I know I don't know or I don't think that you have this position available, but I really would like to work in this particular position. These are the skills that I can offer you and I can work in part time capacity. Will you take me? And that after several conversations actually led her to getting a part time position. So although a position or a role may not be there or is not currently um already part of the company it does not mean that you can't help to create one for yourself and make a space for yourself and that's another really important piece that i've learned that i've actually seen a lot of people manage to do so this healthcare data analyst um posting here is one that actually i got off of the university group, uh, student group website where they're looking for a healthcare data analyst part-time so that's another way in which you can actually manage to get some sort of experience while continuing to do your PhD. Here are just a couple more resources. So of course, online, a big place to get resources. I'm talking about this particular one here, SKIP, so Science Career Impact Project. Um, this, this was actually started by a few alumni from the University of Toronto. And yes, I am actually part of it, so I'm giving it a little bit of a plug. They actually do really amazing work the two people who started it currently work at a pharma company, but their main goal was to start giving graduate students the tools they need to obtain jobs outside of academia. For example, writing your resume, which is very different from your CV. And so we've done, I think we have done over, I don't know, 100 workshops or something like that so far, and it's been amazing. And so you can find them here on Twitter, and this is their website there. There's also Beyond the Professorate, you can find them on Twitter. So they have um, Beyond the Professorate and the Cheeky Scientist, so I didn't link their information here, but they're both on Twitter. You can also find them both on Facebook. They have amazing resources. Um, also resume writing, cover, let cover letter writing, but also the types of uh, the types of jobs that are available post um, post academic post academia, as well as having people come in from outside who have a PhD talk about their job experiences. And here are a few more resources I listed here. So these guides also take you through things to do uh, for interviews, how to prepare for interviews, and more of the same type of. Um, advice uh, for resume writing and the types of jobs that are available out there. And so, yeah, that pretty much brings me to the end of my talk. And I just really wanted to say, of course, everything here says you made it. I really, really want to stress that it can be an extremely stressful and anxiety ridden time when you're looking for a job post PhD. And, and you know that you're firstly going to be coming out of the comfort of academia being in a place that you've always been comfortable in, it's extremely nerve wracking, it's extremely uh, anxiety ridden, but know that you can do it. Many people before us have done it. I would urge you to, like Rupali said in her talk earlier, look for mentors and look for champions and look for people who can help you. But you really need to take that initiative and look and that know that you will be totally fine. So I'm not quite there yet, but I know. I know in my heart that I will be fine. I'm not stressed out about it, thankfully. But I know I also have that experience from before that maybe some of you don't have. And so that would probably cause a bit of anxiety for you. But I would tell you, don't worry about it. You'll be totally fine. And that's it for awesome. me. Awesome. Thank you so much, 